And it says, men will fear God and give honor to Him for your namesake or because of your life. Men will go, whoa. And it'll click. So when Christ appears in my life, I'm going to appear with Him. Therefore, because, that means because this is true, in light of what I just said, put to death. He didn't say manage. Put to death your members which are on the earth. It's amazing. The first thing always mentioned is your sexual arena. Fornication. That's sex drive. Sex. He didn't say manage it. He said put it to death. The way you know it to be. I wonder if that came from Adam. Put it to death and find out what it really looks like in me. I know that's intent. I got, man, I feel wheels spinning all the time on that one. The day... The morning after I got saved, I realized my definition of manhood could not possibly be the kingdom. Because it was at the expense of another person. Nobody's on the earth to satisfy a desire in my life. Can I be bold and raw with what I said to the Lord that day when you weren't there crying and crying and crying? I'm going to be graphic. Don't get offended at me. I saw God, it was Holy Spirit. He showed me my definition of manhood that I acquired it from when I found a pornographic magazine at age 11 on an empty loading dock on a Sunday afternoon and went. That's where it started. And then locker rooms and boy conversations. And, and all of a sudden I'm trained and taught by the lie. And now I think I know what a man is. And on that morning after I got saved, I was crying and you weren't there. And I was rocking on my floor. And I said, God, my manhood definition came to the forefront. And I said, God, you couldn't have made me this way. It's completely self-centered and focused. This didn't come from you. This came from the locker room, from the world, from a magazine. I said, there's no way Adam was walking in the garden with an erection and saying, what should I do with this thing? So you made a woman. I said, you have to deliver me. I've been deceived. And I can't even tell you the glory of how God touched me. We probably ought to be willing to put that stuff on the altar and let the fire burn it. I talked to three pastors about this in my life intimately, and they all cut me off and said, whoa, stop, you're freaking me out. I love my sex life, stop. Do you hear what they said? I love my sex life. I wonder if it's not your sex life. I wonder if you have a covenant of love and it's not about your sex life. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you ask Jesus about what I'm saying. Because watch this. You don't counterfeit $1 bills. And there's no area on the earth of humanity that's been exploited and perverted more than the one I'm talking about. You will find none that's been exploited, twisted, and on the forefront more than sexuality. That's because there's an incredible value, both holy root and lump there in truth that we failed to seek. So we just wrap Christian language around the world's way. Yeah. I want something a little deeper than, hey, it's been three days, honey, huh? I want something a little deeper than you scratching an itch. I want I love you. And you're the only one that I can be in this with. Because I've given myself to you and all that is mine is yours. And all of a sudden woman was made out of the fullness of God in man in the garden. He didn't make another lump of clay. He made Jason in his image to walk in him and be in his image and to be filled and complete and full in him. And he looked at Jason and said, whoa, it isn't good that man be alone. He didn't make another lump of clay and call it Tina. He reached into what was already there and one in him, brought out Tina and made one, two out of one so two could enjoy one. Yeah. So here's the deal. 
If Tina's in Jason's life, it ought to be because of the fullness of God in Jason, not the need of Jason. Because woman was created to be loved by God and receive the pure love of God through the man in that relationship and open herself up to what edifies, increases, builds, and brings the best on here. And it's a total thing of trust and unity and oneness. And she opens up herself and even opens up her gates. And he comes into that secret holy place and two are one in that place. You can find it in Hebrews 10. It's a spiritual thing. You enter into the holy place through the sprinkling of blood and the veil of flesh. <laughs> it's a spiritual thing. He gave you the privilege of experiencing that through covenant intercourse where man goes into a woman through the veil of her flesh. There's a breaking of a veil. There's a sprinkling of blood. There's blood in the semen. There's blood covenant. The veil doesn't grow back because two have become one. And man goes into woman, into the depth of who she is, into the most intimate place, into the core of the woman, and two are one in that place. Two conceive in that place, and their love is multiplied and fruitful on the earth. We've turned it into one night stands, sex drive, orgasms. Shame on us. We've wrapped spiritual language around the world, and we're missing the glory of God. <laughs> I don't need my wife. I love her. And I don't chase her around and drag her by the hair with a club. <laughs> and it's not, well, your body is not your own. That's obligatory. And it's twisted, and we ought to knock it off. I'm sorry I'm being so raw with this thing, but it's just the way it's in me, man. He reached into the fullness of God in the man. He's naming all the animals and God's going, yeah, awesome, okay, whoa. He didn't correct him. He didn't upstage him. He didn't belittle him. He didn't say, you can't call it a giraffe. That sounds stupid. If Adam said giraffe, guess what it was? Because he's flowing in the wisdom of God. He's given authority to subdue. He, God looks at Adam and sees himself and says, man, all the animals have a comparable. There's none comparable to him. You're not a weaker vessel, women. You're not in the sense of a lack of value. He reaches into the man and brings out the woman out of the fullness of God and the man and makes what was one, two, so two can enjoy the beauty of one. Two souls, two wills, two emotional makeups surrendered and dead to themselves for the common cause of his image and the synergism of one plus one is a stronger one. That sure beats you do for me, I'll do for you. Hey, a marriage is 50-50 and a lot of work. My wife's very liberated knowing she's not under the pressure of breaking my heart and failing me. <laughs> That's petty to me at this point. <laughs> oh my goodness. We think the people that we're closest to can hurt us the most. That's what we say. But they're the people you say, I love. And love takes no account of a suffer wrong because it doesn't seek its own. We probably just need them more than we understand love. And we're depending on them for our sake instead of laying down our life for theirs. Come on, if you're going to talk about living love, we probably ought to bring it. And we've hurt each other in our own homes. You've got to get that stuff out of there. You've got to let... There would be no unresolved stuff. You got, I don't care if you did each other wrong. I mean, I care. I wish we didn't. But if we did, you ought to take a message like this and say, duh, what was I thinking? Forgive me, honey. Don't elbow. Say, oh, my goodness. He's talking to me. He's not. Don't listen for your spouse. Listen for you. Because if you're listening for your spouse, then I'm surely talking to you. If you're sitting there thinking, boy, I hope she's listening. I hope he's listening. You've missed the whole point. God's shouting to you. Why you don't just sit married? Yeah, I don't just, I haven't married anybody for years and years. I get asked a lot. I do like the best wedding on the planet. <laughs> and that's what I tell them when I say, sorry, I'm not going to do a wedding. <laughs> don't I? <laughs> I see it's a shame too because it's an amazing spirit for a wedding and Holy Spirit would come. <laughs> 
This is all, thanks, brother. <laughs> One man said, well, I'm just going to pray Jesus walks in your bedroom and tells you. Maybe that was you, too. <laughs> said, go and walk in your bedroom and tell you. And it's not that I'm against marriage or people getting married. It, it, there's time, accountability. It's not a small thing. It's not a starry-eyed, emotional, ooh, baby, I love you. It is a covenant giving yourself to one another. It's not an emotional, I need you, I feel for you, you're the one who... It's it's a giving of yourself to another person. It's the total expression of selflessness and love. And a lot of times people come together because of the needs in their life. And they need one another and that's why marriages turn into the biggest hurt and heartbreak of people's lives because the reason they did this is because I need you even though I say I love you. I need what you give to me. I need what you have for me. I need what you make me feel like. I need who you make me to be. Christ Jesus is the only one that can fit that bill. And out of the strength and fullness of your life in Christ, you find that person to love. That's marriage. And I've done a whole lot of weddings, and I do serious spiritual counseling on that topic. And and I've struggled. It's this emotional thing for me. Because I've watched a lot of marriages that I... Because when I stand there and do a wedding, I'm very accountable. In the days when Jesus comes back, it'll be like Noah. Men will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. And every man will just be doing what they do. And Jesus is going to come and bring light to it all. And that scripture grabbed me one day. Doesn't mean I can't counsel on marriage. Doesn't mean I can't preach on these things. But I don't, I'm not compelled to stand here and actually say, I agree with this. It's the will of God. It's ordained. I I just, I'm not in that place right now. I don't even have faith for that because of a lot of the heartbreak, a lot of the marriages that I had done and sowed all that truth into. You can't even believe some of the horror stories. Like shortly after. Like, found a boyfriend, don't think we were too young, maybe we weren't ready. And I started hearing, it's, it's, when you're serious and you're not just a weekend pastor and you're not doing, because I wouldn't take a penny, I've never received a dime for doing a wedding or all the counseling, ever. I won't take that, I'm not in this for that, that's silly to me. And when you give your heart like that, and then you hear that they're not together, it, it sobers you, it startles you, it, it, it puts you to a place of tears and prayer. And, and So I'm not saying it's the right decision, but for a long time, like Jenny said, I've just said, well, you know what, for now, I'm just not going to do weddings until I get a better revelation. Not that I'm believing the worst about people. Right now, my life's in a place where I can't take the time, actually, that I would have to take to have the conscience to marry someone. Because I need a lot of time to be together with you. Like more time than you're together with one another. <laughs> <laughs> I have learned, guys, whether you're young, middle aged, or older, most people are getting married because of the need in their life. Not getting any younger. Well, I want to have kids soon. And all of a sudden, all these motives attract you in a direction that works. And love is a selfless giving of yourself to one another. Anger, wrath, malice. It's easy in this Christian culture to say, I love you, and turn around and despise and argue and fight, and then find friends in the church to support your case because you shared all the issues, and then have them take your side. And no wonder you're hurting. If I was married to them, I'd feel just like you. That's the church conversations that goes on at the coffee tables. They said, What? They did what? Well, no wonder you're upset. we got a long way to go in understanding love and we're going to take a couple weeks probably on that one and it's going to stretch you like a rubber band (laughs) and I'm going to quit preaching until I hear pops all over the room (laughs) it's a very serious thing She she hit a chord with me she really did it's a very serious topic to me I've watched countless young people get into relationships, do the whole dating thing, compelled by the world and don't even realize that they're innocent and they're sure they're in love. How do, you, how do you touch that and minister to that? Only to watch them pass through relationships, hurt, make mistakes, touchy-feely, give up the honor of their intimacy, and now one day they're married. Man, that whole dating thing is twisted. 
it's, it's just twisted. If you're in Christ and He's your life and He gives you the desire of your heart, man, He can lead your life in every area, can He? You're not fishing in a fish pond and you're not test driving cars. You're living by the Spirit. You open something up with me, Jenny. <laughs> this is a serious topic to me. I've watched as a pastor too many young people live in regrets and make mistakes, the same ones over and over again. Can I make a strong and stark statement? I've done a lot of weddings and I've only married two, to my knowledge, that stayed pure and made it all about Jesus right up until the wedding day so that it could be all about Him when they got married. Only two. Everybody else, when it came right down to it, confessed that they were already living as married sexually. They were kids growing up the whole time in the church. And Christian people, dating, Christian dating services, whatever that is, that's another issue of mine. <laughs> Christian dating is living by the Spirit and giving your whole life to Jesus. <laughs> and then He will lead your life in that area. You're going fishing on a Christian internet. Christian, we tack Christian to it. I know a singles club in this county, a singles club that was home-based in a church, I'm going to be rude and raw with it, is a meat market. And there was so much fornication going on, it breaks my heart. Under a church sanction. Because we think if it's Christian, hey, we're Christian. My wife asked me if I was a Christian. And I said, well, of course. Because I knew it kept me in and not out. You can say anything, guys. What you say... It's what you do that reveals who you are. Your words are very cheap until they're backed with your life. You all okay? Just blame it on the lady in the green. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's important stuff. Are you, this is school. This is what we do in school. You'll get used to it if you're not already. It's just stuff comes up and we nailed it. And that one grabbed me when she asked the question. I went, oh God. Not that it was wrong. It's... It's a big topic. I could take a whole class on it. We might end up. I'm just saying, you just reconsider what's motivating your life in every area, especially that dating thing. You know, we take our marriage traditions a lot from culture. and A lot of Jewish culture, you'd be amazed how a lot of the stuff we do comes from Christian culture. So here you got a girl coming down an aisle with a veil. Her face is covered. That means she's been living covered. Her daddy is standing at the end and who gives this bride in marriage? I do. The daddy goes over and unveils his daughter and he's giving her away. He's uncovering her in the sense of her face. She's not daddy's girl anymore. He's giving her to this man because he believes that this man is representing God to her and can love her like Christ loves the church so the daddy watch he rolls the veil back and exposes her face at the end of the ceremony this stuff isn't rhetorical it has great meaning the pastor he's doing the and, and, and I give myself to you yes I give and it vows and he says I pronounce you man and wife well they got joined by the spirit when they gave themselves in vows but when he officially pronounces him wife he says this you may now kiss her what's he implying that she's been covered all that time. And now, now you have the right to touch your lips against hers in an intimate fashion and express emotion and feeling because you've just given yourself to her and you're hers and she's yours and you're one. And we've turned it into heat and emotion and kissing in the drop of a hat and just kissed by 16 and first kiss and ooh and parents and prom did, did you kiss him did he kiss you and yeah. we're sucked in to the soap opera of life we don't even understand the exchange of emotion when lips touch lips with feeling and desire and where that leads and what that does think about it who gives her because until that moment she's not yours She's his. <laughs> and on that day, in honor and respect and integrity, not behind the scenes, behind the parents' backs and behind doing everything else too. 
on that day, the honor of it all is amazing. And God is right there when that's all honored. It's amazing. I was in two of those settings where you, you had to try to stand up because of God's presence. I, have, I know there's a video. I could probably track it down with the best man and the next guy were backslid. And when Holy Spirit came at the vows, they fell over. And they weren't playing church. They were backslidden. And it shook them bad. And they grabbed me at the end with tears and said, that was crazy. What's going on? Oh, God, God. And because the, I felt the Holy Spirit come over me like a wind because these two stayed pure and kept themselves. And when I told her God was excited to come to her wedding, she cried profusely. And she said, what? I said, well, think about it. And I shared the heart involved in Christ. And, and then on that day when the piano keys touched and they were ready to exchange vows, I felt a tangible, physical wind go, and I saw for a moment, I don't see that stuff a lot, but I saw Holy Spirit. I don't know how He does it, but He does it because He lives in all of us. He came over my shoulders and went two ways. He went this way and this way. And He overlapped this way and this way about four times and went like that. It was incredible. And I'm standing there going, and they're going. <laughs> and these two backslidden boys are like this, holding on to each other. And I'm standing there going, Jesus, you're really real and amazing, and I really love you, and you're really, wow. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I realize I'm not on a tangent. There's something to all this. I wonder if we're forfeiting it for the expression of emotion and temporal gratification and superficial fulfillment that'll keep robbing us in the long run. 